Uh, yesterday, uh, I said to you that, you know, the theme, of, our conference is called Thrive, but every year we kind of have a, an underlying theme. And this year, I just really felt like uh, the theme is, should be the word forever. And, and it deals with a lot of concepts and a lot of thoughts. And, and I'm not asking any of the speakers to follow this. It's just something that I'm, I felt incurs in my heart to bring to you in the sessions that I have in the mornings and to bring these thoughts to you. And so uh, I want to go back and share with you, uh, for those of you who maybe weren't here yesterday, I'm kind of taking three aspects. Uh, yesterday was one, today's one, and tomorrow's another, uh, where I'm, I'm talking about this as it appears in Scripture and, and different ideas about it and surrounding it. And so, you know, you know me. Uh, you know, before I go anything, I always got to look a word up, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, John Gray thought I was crazy because I, I use dictionaries, but <laughs> I think he's immature and will learn. <laughs> and respect his elders, <laughs> for they shall be asked back. Amen. So, uh, so I looked up the word forever. And uh, in, a, in a Hebrew English dictionary, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I always get a kick out of some of the definitions that the dictionary guys give because the first definition, right, that this 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 man wrote, and he's got like 19 PhDs, right? You know, he's Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. I mean, all these PhDs. And the first definition of the word forever, he said, means a very long time. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Hey, can we give an amen to the doctor, right? Hey, you know, I. I could have come up with that one myself, all right, a very long time. But it's the next definitions that really, really spoke to me. And, and he said that in the Hebrew language, the word forever usually refers, listen, to looking forward. Yeah, but many times it expresses the idea of also looking backward. So I want you to kind of keep that thought in mind, right? So when we're talking about forever, we're talking about backward and forward, okay? And then he goes on to say that it, it, the word forever is a word that is used that covers a person's lifetime. Not a moment, not a week, not a month, not a year, a lifetime, all right? Lifetime. He went on to say that forever is time beyond the temporal sphere. So then there is time in this temporal sphere that we live in, that we're in today. But then he said to us that the idea comes from the Hebrew that, that there is time beyond the temporal sphere. That's kind of an interesting thought. You know, all my life I've always told people that God, God doesn't, uh, you know, isn't affected by time. But it appears in the Hebrew language that there is a time beyond earth time. That there is a, another time. And it is forever time. Earth time is temporary time, right? There'll come a day when we don't use calendars here anymore. All this will come, but that other time that God is in, whew, it's way beyond my pay scale. All right, time beyond the temporal sphere, and it is used, all, especially when used regarding God, is what he says in the text. So, uh, I, I, uh, we, we looked at Hebrews 13, 8 yesterday because I said to you that I think of all the forever verses in the Bible, that's probably the most famous. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we looked at it in the context of what, of what was, where it was used in the verses, and it deals with, with leadership and, and following people that have a sameness to their life, that there's a sameness there. And so I don't have time to go over all that. If you weren't here, get the CD. I want to take you into something else today, all right? So that's the review. Here we go. All right. As I began to look at this and I began to study it, you know, I did, I did what many Bible teachers do. I got out of concordance and I began to go through all of the places uh, where the term forever appears. And it is, it is a, a, a much used word in scripture, much more than, I mean, I knew it was used a lot, but it's used much more than I even imagined it was. It is a it is a, a, a big word in Bible, all right? It repeats itself many times, Old and New Testament, all right? Well, so I, what I did is I just went through it, and I just want to walk you through it real quick. This isn't all of them, but it just gives you an idea of some of the places that the word forever is used in reference, in, in reference to God, all right? So uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, it says that his word stands forever. His word stands stands forever. So it is, a, it, it is used in reference to God's word, not only to God, but also to God's 
word. And so it brings back home once again, all right, that, you know, God and his word are inseparable. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, I, 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 you know, I guess I've kind of come to the stage in my life now, you know, where, you know, people think I'm profound, you know, whatever. Uh, but, you know, so they come up, you know, I have a lot of young, younger people ask me and they say, well, you know, you know, pastor, would, would you, would you, would you pray for me that I get a better relation with the Lord? And I say, no, <laughs> no. And they always look at me like, oh my God, you're not near as spiritual as I thought you were. How do you even pastor a church? And I say, no, I'm not going to pray for you that, that you get a better relation with the Lord. If you want a better relation with the Lord, get in the word. The word is God. The Word is God. You're not going to go God outside of His Word other than shallow. You'll know Him shallow outside of the Word, but if you want to know God, you've got to know the Word because God and the Word are the same. They're, they're inseparable. Amen. So, in the Word of the Lord endures forever. Psalm 10, verse 16 says, The Lord is King forever. Psalm 45, verse 6 says, Thy throne is forever, O God. Psalm 45, verse 17 says that the, your people will praise you forever. All right? Psalm uh, 66, verse 7 says that he rules by his power forever. All right? Psalm 72, verse 17 says his name shall endure forever. Psalm 111, verse 3 says his righteousness endures forever. Forever. Matthew 6.13 says that thine is the power and the glory forever. Hebrews 1.6 says thy throne, O God. God the Father speaking to God the Son says thy throne, O God, is forever. Hebrews 6.20 says that Jesus is a high priest forever. And that's just a sampling of some of the things that I, that I wanted to point out to you today. But as I, as I looked at this, as I began to break it down and I began to study it, and there was one characteristic and, and, and that, that jumped off of the pages of the concordance. I guess it took for me to sit there and to see all of these forever verses lined up from, from, from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation and to see them all lined up. And when I saw them, there was one characteristic. If I had my trusty whiteboard up here, which I will not put all of you through that I make my church family go through, all right? But if I had my trusty whiteboard up here and we scaled it, right? And we said, you know, we, had, we listed them by how, how many times these characteristics repeat. You know, like, like how many times the Bible says his righteousness endures forever. You know, there'd be four or five references to that in the scripture, maybe, maybe eight or ten, that it would pop up. And if we charted them, they would go like this, right? They would kind of be like this. But there's one characteristic that if you charted it, you'd have, you'd have you know, these things. You understand what I'm saying to you, right? Rep repetition of verses in reference to a characteristic. And you would go like this, and then there's one that goes like this. I mean, it just, it just jumps out at you. There, there, there is no other characteristic of the forever nature of God that is more magnified in Scripture than this one that I want to speak, speak to you about this morning. There's no comparison. I, I, I want to say to you again, there's no comparison. Not even, not even the references to the Word in doing. Not even the references to His, 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 uh, his uh, righteousness. Not even the characteristics that His throne. Not even the characteristics that people will praise you. All right? And all those things are repeated. But this one, there is no... Again, it's like this, right? You're like this, and then it goes... It just jumps off. And it is obvious, as I looked at it, that God was saying, you need to pay attention to this. You need to get this, Charles. You need to understand this. Of all the things that, that of what I am, this is what I want you to know. This is what I want to be known for. And as I began to look at it, I began to see things that I had never seen. And I'm so excited to be able to come and share them with you here today. So turn in your Bible with me real quick to Psalm 118. And if you think I'm talking fast, it is because I am. Because I'm in a hurry to get you to where I want to get you. 
So I feel like right now I'm kind of going through the chips and the salsa and all that, and we got to get to the hot fudge brownie Sunday. All right, so here we go. Psalm 118, look, begin with, have you got it? Have you got it? Don't look on the screens. I don't put the verses on the screens. You have to bring your own Bible. I don't know why, I don't know why, I don't know why we have to do all the work. Bring your own Bible. <laughs> Psalm 118. And sometime at two o'clock in the morning, and you need to know where a verse is, you, you're not gonna be able to come down here and look up there. <laughs> We're not opening for you and bringing the, the guys down to pump it up on the screen for you. You you got you gotta you gotta know. Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his endures. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them that fear the Lord say that his mercy endures forever. You know, Psalm 118 is famous for a lot of the great promises that are in it. Look at verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. Psalm 24. You've heard this one before. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is one of the most famous verses in the Bible, right? Let us rejoice and be this is the day the Lord has made. You ever heard that verse, right? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But it started with four verses saying to us that it is his mercy. His mercy that endures forever. His mercy that endures forever. The Bible dictionary defines the word mercy, write this down as the following, kindness. His kindness endures forever. His loving kindness endures forever. His goodness endures forever. His faithfulness, this is all a part of the word mercy. His faithfulness endures forever. His love, love ends in mercy. Did you catch what I just said to you? Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me jump ahead of you right here, right? God loves you because of the, you know what produced that love? Mercy. Oh, you, no, you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to be blown away today. I promise you are, and unless you've already studied this out, which I doubt if you have, so here we go. All right? So, so it is his kindness, his loving kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his love. The, the, the word mercy also means acts of kindness. So God is not only kind, he acts kind. There are acts of kindness. Wow. There's no other verse that explains this. And I'm going to show it to you today in a way I've never seen it. I've taught it. Many of the pastors in here have taught it. I, I feel like I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm trying to teach these guys something they probably already know. But turn with me to Psalm 136. Man, I, I, I don't know how I've missed this. Psalm 136, in case you've never looked at it, just scan through it and, and look at the end of every verse. 26 verses in a row, they end exactly the same. Do you see it? Huh? Every verse. Well, let's read a few of them. Verse 1, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy. Mercy endures forever to him that alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endures forever to him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever to him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever to him that made great lights, for his mercy endures forever, the sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever, the moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever to him that smote Egypt in the firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, that brought Israel out from among them, for his mercy endures forever with a strong hand and with his outstretched arm, for his mercy mercy endures forever to them to him that divided the Red Sea into parts for his mercy endures forever and made Israel to pass through the midst of it for his mercy endures forever but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea for his mercy endures forever to him who led his people through the, the wilderness for his mercy endures forever to him which smote great kings for his mercy endures forever, and slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever, and Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever, and gave their land for heritage 
for his mercy endures forever. Even an inheritance unto Israel his servant, for his mercy endures forever, who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endures forever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever, who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. Now, what is clear here? What do we see here? Let me break it down for you, verse, right? What we see in this psalm is an incredible revelation from God to you and me. And that is, that is that all of these things that God described all happen because of his mercy. It was his mercy that birthed them. It was his mercy that that brought them about. This is not some cute little thing where, you know, the psalmist is, oh, you know, let's talk about the history of Israel and, and let's throw in this rep repetitive thing of his mercy. No, it is a revelation of why these things happen, how come they happen, what brought them to pass, why it all occurred. Let me break it down to you, right? In verse 1, it reveals to us that it, was his, it is his mercy that underlies his goodness. Right? Psalm 119, 165 says, Thou art good and doeth good. But where does that goodness come from? God wants you to know that goodness is birthed out of his mercy. It is his mercy that produces and births that goodness. It is his mercy that underlies his goodness. Verses 2 and 3 says that it is his mercy that supports his unchallenged position as God and Lord. Oh. Let me say it to you again. It is his mercy that supports his unchallenged position as God and Lord. God is not God and Lord because he is harsh and judgmental and mean and, and, and ready to send people to hell. It is what, 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 what supports his unchallenged position as God and Lord is because he is merciful. That is what separates him. And no one can challenge his position as God and Lord because of his mercy. Not because of his power. It's his mercy that has established his throne. Verses 4 through 9 shows us that it is his mercy that is the basis for his great and wondrous position as God. It is his mercy that makes him great and wondrous. Great and wondrous. You know, when I say, God, you are wonderful, what I'm saying is, you are merciful. It is your mercy that fills me with wonder. Verses 10 through 15 reveals to us that it is his mercy. It is mercy that is the reason he delivered and redeemed Israel from Pharaoh and the Red Sea. Let me say that to you again. It, is, it was mercy that caused him, was the reason that he delivered and redeemed Israel from Pharaoh and the Red Sea. C. Verse 16 says that mercy was the reason for his guidance in the desert. Are you writing these words down? All right, I'll come back to him and point them out to you again. Verses 17 through 22 reveals to us that it was his mercy that was the reason why he gifted Israel with their land and defeated their enemies. It was his mercy. His mercy, plain and simple. Verses 23 through 25 reveals to us that, that mercy, mercy is the reason for his ancient and continuing, backward, forward, for his ancient and continuing deliverance of his people. It's mercy. Mercy that brought it all about. Verse 26 reveals to us that it is his mercy 
that is the basis for his rulership in heaven. So look at this. In this psalm so far, what we have discovered is, is that mercy is the reason for us looking backward. We look backward and we see it. We look here. We look forward today. And it is his mercy that, that gives us the reason to know that he is and was and ever shall be his goodness, right? That he has an unchallenged position of the God, as God and Lord, that he is great and wondrous in our lives today, that he delivers and redeems us. Can I get a good amen today, right? That he guides us. All of this is being produced out of his mercy. All of this is coming out of his mercy, and he wants you to see that. All of it comes out of his mercy, right? That he gifts you, right? You say, well, he gifted the land of Israel. What has he gifted me with? The kingdom of God, right? He has gifted you with the kingdom of God, right? He's gifted me with the kingdom of God, amen? Why? Because he's merciful. Couldn't help himself. He's merciful. And why he defeats our enemies, you ought to underline that. He defeats our enemies. What defeats our enemies? His power? Mm, his mercy. It is his mercy that defeated the enemies of Israel. It's his mercy that is going to defeat your enemies. Right? It is his mercy that has produced ancient and continuing deliverance. Ancient and continuing deliverance. It is his mercy that I can look to for rulership in my life and rulership in your life. The entire span, this psalm makes it clear to us, listen to this, that the entire span of creation all the way up to God's redemption and the preservation and the permanent establishment of his kingdom is revealed to us in this psalm as being birthed by only one thing, his mercy. So creation to redemption, the preservation of that redemption and the permanent establishment of it is all held together by one thing, his mercy. His mercy. To say it to you another way, it all happened, is happening, and will continue to happen because of his mercy. Oh, I'm going to say that again. I liked it. It all happened. It all happened, looking backward. It all happened, all the way back to when God said, let there be. It all happened, continues to happen, and will happen because of one, 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 one trait. His mercy that endures forever. Everything you have, I have, your children will have, your grandchildren have, everything Adam and Eve had, Abraham had, Adam, Jacob, all of them had, all of it, all of it, all of it came out of one quality, God's mercy. All of it continues to be birthed out of his mercy. And it is his mercy that endures forever. The entire span of your lifetime. I'm here today because of mercy. You are here today because of mercy. You were conceived in your mother's womb because of mercy. You are living because of mercy. You will live because of mercy. You will die in mercy and you will go to mercy. Jesus came to the earth because of mercy. He hung on a cross because of mercy. He bore your sicknesses and carried your pains. He was made to be poor. He was separated. He was made to be sin. He was rejected all because of one thing, because of mercy. All of creation, I'm going to keep saying it to you again, it all happened, is happening, will continue to happen because of mercy. It is the one quality above all other qualities that God wants us to see, and yet religion has blinded our eyes to it. Blinded our eyes to it. 
Mercy is what produced the love of God. Mercy is what produced the grace of God. Mercy is what produced the redemption. Mercy is what produced defeat of your enemies. Mercy is what causes all of this to happen. Mercy. Let me show it to you in operation. Are you ready? Second Chronicles chapter 20. Am I the only one hearing music? I was like, God, let me finish. Marcos is here. I want to hear tonight. Brian's coming. I don't want the, don't don't let that pass pass me by. I'm not ready to get on. All right, Second Second Chronicles chapter 20. All right? No, oh, I got to get, that's First Chronicles. Come on. There we go. I don't have time to read the whole chapter to you. I'm going to encourage you to go home and read it. But let me just give you a summary of it, right? I mean, it goes all the way through. Uh, the part we want to look at would go all the way through verse 30. All right, so that's way too many verses to to read together, back to back to back to back. All right, but there's a couple of things I want you to see, and I'll just summarize it for you. All right, Uh, what has happened is, is in the history of the nation of Israel, uh, they have divided Israel now. And so uh, one king took uh, a bunch of tribes, and and then Jehoshaphat ended up with Judah and Jerusalem. All right, so he had the most prized part, Jerusalem, but he just had uh, uh, that... Just, just, just the tribe of Judah, all right, and Jerusalem. Now, I've done a lot of research on this, and it's very interesting. I didn't know this until I studied it out. It's believed by many historians, biblical and even non-biblical historians, that at this time, Jehoshaphat had a standing army of 1.5 million men. It was one of the largest armies ever assembled. All right, it's gigantic. The United States, I think, at the height of Iraq and Afghanistan, we had about 300,000. All right, so this was a standing army of 1.5 million men. All right, and the reason why he had such a huge army is because his nation was small, and 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 the other you know the other ten tribes were to the south, and he was kind of standing there by himself, and so he just amassed this huge army. Well, one day word comes to him that three other kings around him had joined forces together. All right, and they amassed an army that does not tell us the size, and I I couldn't really figure it out. Uh, the historians couldn't tell me, but their army was so big that when the word came to Jehoshaphat that this army was coming, that he would not even send his army of 1.5 million out into the field because they would have been slaughtered. So that's how big this other army was. So I don't know what, what was it, three times, four times, five times? I have no idea. But the historians say this may have been, and what's amazing is it's kind of been ignored all right, but because it wasn't fought in a classic battle thing, like, you know, uh, other famous battles. Uh, this was fought in a weird way, and so, you know, military historians are like, well, we're not going to fight this way. So, you know, they don't study it, but it, was, it, was a, it is considered by some historians as maybe the largest single amassing of armies in history. So there could have been anywhere between seven to eight million men going to war. It's gigantic. All right, so Jehoshaphat, right? Now get this, I'm going to go really quick, all right? So Jehoshaphat is standing there, and I think he probably felt real confident with all this army that he'd amassed, 1.5 million men. I think China has two million. It's the biggest standing army in the world. Well, here's little old Judah, right? He's got a million and a half. All right, and so he's got all of this, and he he probably felt pretty confident about it. And then yet, now get this, this is so significant. And then yet, a problem comes that is so much bigger than his resources that he didn't even, he doesn't even attempt to move his resources against it. It's futile. And does that happen in life or what? You know, you think you, you think you got it all 
Hmm? Got all the bases covered. And then something comes and it just makes all of your preparation like, <laughs> I can't even, I got all this in it. All this I have, if I throw it against that, that's going to slaughter this. So Jehoshaphat does something very interesting. He prays. When all else fails. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I got this army, but it's worthless. Let's pray. <laughs> and he calls all the people and they pray. And while they're praying, I'm really summarizing this all right, really quick for you. So while they're praying, there's a Levite out in the crowd, right? Part of the, part of the praise family. So there's a Levite out in the crowd, and the Spirit of God comes on him. Now, I can't tell you why him, but the Spirit of God comes on him. And he comes to the front. Joseph has up in front of him, and he's praying, and he comes to the front. And he says, Thus saith the Lord, you will go out tomorrow, and you will not fight. For the battle is the Lord's. And he tells them, you will stand still and see the salvation of God. So Joseph gets all happy. And they go to bed that night. Oh, and I want to point out to you something. Let me, let me show you something here because I think this is vital. Because it, it, I think it will speak to some of you, right? So in verse 13, he calls everyone to prayer. In verse 15, they're told that the battle is the Lord's. In verse 17, they're told by the same, by the same Levite to not be afraid, right? And so then what you discover is in verse 10 that these three armies that have come against them, write this down. This is, this is vital for a couple of you. These three armies that come against them, when Joshua came into the promised land, these armies were there, and Joshua was going to go against them and destroy them, and God stopped them and said, don't destroy them. And now, decades later, these three armies come against Israel, and Joseph had reminds God of that. He said, you know what? We were ready to destroy them, and they are repaying our kindness by attacking us. You know, it's interesting sometimes in life, and I'm not trying to be negative or mean or ugly or anything, but it's a fact of life, that sometimes the very people that you have been the kindest to end up betraying you. The very people that you reached out to and you showed kindness to them, they end up betraying you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? They, they later on come against you. Hmm? Am I, I'm not the only one this has ever happened to, is it? And so he, and I want you to notice something here. Jehoshaphat takes that to God. He doesn't just sit back and go, well, that's okay. No, he goes, look at this. I, I wouldn't be having this problem today. If you'd have let me deal with them the way I wanted to in the beginning. If you'd have let Jeho Joshua and Caleb, mm -hmm. but no. That's Charles Neiman prayer right there, all right? So anyway, does that, uh, I hope maybe that helps somebody, right? So, you know, sometimes this happens in life, and I think that's an important thing to look at. It's a little detail that God brings out, right? So the next morning, so you, you, can, you can read this, right? It's really cool, right? So in verse 17, he says, tomorrow go out against them. He tells them, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. So Jehoshaphat bows down, all the people, they begin to worship and pray, and they thank God, and then it's tomorrow. And verse 20, and they arose early in the morning, they went forth in the wilderness of Tekoa, where God told them to go, and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said to the people, hear me, O Judah, hear me, O El Paso, and the inhabitants of abundant living. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he consulted with the people, watch this, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, what? <laughs> so 
So he took the army, but he put the singers in front of the army. They don't teach this at the Pentagon. They don't teach this at the War College in, 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 uh, in, in D.C. You don't put the singers out in front of the army. You put the SEALs and the Delta and the Rangers out in front. You send them in first. So Jehoshaphat puts the singers out in front. Now I want you to notice what they sang. They go out and they sing, praise the Lord. Now, I want you to notice something. They're facing an army that can destroy their army of 1.5 million, an army that God has told them, don't even send them out because they'll all get killed. Right? This, 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 this problem is so gigantic. Now, as I looked at this, Right As I studied it, as I looked at it, I thought, what would my reaction have been? What if I was in that spot? What would I have been praying for? You know what? I w the first thing that came to my mind, I would have been shouting out, you know, praise the Lord for his power is overcomes. Praise the Lord for he is king of all. Praise the Lord because if God be for me, who can be against me? Praise the Lord. I, I had all these things I would have prayed and I promise you nowhere on my list was what they did. They went out and you know why? Because I have a, a Hallmark card sissy view of what I'm talking to you about today. Right, We have been robbed of the power of the mercy of God. We have never seen it the way God wants us to see it. So as they walk out to face this unstoppable, undefeatable army that they have no resources to overcome, the thing that God puts in their heart to sing was not about his power, not about his love, not about, no, no. They sung about praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Why would they sing that? Because they had a history of understanding that from the beginning, it all happened because of mercy, is happening because of mercy, and will happen because of mercy. And so they began to sing to that army. They began to sing to that army. His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. They could have sung of his power. They could have sung of his righteousness. They could have sung of his deliverance. All of that happened. But all of that happened because of his mercy. All of that was birthed. The Red Sea, the manna, the quail, the deliverance, the protection, the blood. All of it happened because of his mercy. They just got right down to it. They just went right to the source. His mercy endures forever. And as they sang that, these three armies, the Bible said, then God set ambushments amongst them. They turned on each other. The three armies turned on each other and killed each other, and it took Jehoshaphat and the 1.5 million man army three days to recover the loot and haul it all back to Jerusalem. That's the only thing the army did was enjoy the fruits of the victory. In verse 30, I want you to see this and then we'll stop. In verse 30, I love this. I love it. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet. Yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> For his God gave him rest round about. Rest. Come unto me. All ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But what gives you that rest? What gave Jehoshaphat that rest? God's mercy. Stand to your feet with me, please.